when you hear her voice, you hear a bit of Mary J. Blige. Jackie Goucher is the foundation of music. Her decades of work include singing with the likes of Elton John, Michael Jackson, Tina Turner, Diana Ross, Quincy Jones, and so many more. She sang in the color purple, but she is more than that. Music is the foundation of her family. Her three sons, D. Smoke, Sir, and Davion Harris, have all seen their own success in the business. In fact, they are Grammy nominated, and D. Smoke was the final winner of the rap competition, Rhythm and Flow on Netflix. Goucher's brother, Andrew, is the godfather of gospel bass players, and her niece, Tiffany, is also a singer-songwriter. Jackie Goucher is the author of three books, including Raising Kings, about her three sons, and How Would I Know, which talks about her drug addiction, to which she has been sober for more than two decades now. Please welcome to the show, Jackie Goucher. It's my pleasure to be here. <clears throat> Okay, first of all, before we get started, I have to ask you, because I don't want to break any rules, so as a songwriter and artist, are you or your family affected by the SAG-AFTRA writer's strike? Not at all. Okay, okay. We shall continue. <laughs> do you remember when you first fell in love with music? I absolutely do. I was 12 years old and my mom who sang for a living at the time taught my brothers and I how to sing harmony and so just the feeling of our voices coming together and blending in three parts but one sound it was like a magical feeling to me so I fell in love with music um actually you know what I fell in love with it before then but that's when I realized that it was a gift that I could actually use so I was about 12 years old who did you hang out with in the industry when you first started your career? I started, well, it, my brother introduced me to, he was always proud of, he, first of all, he introduced me to my music teacher in high school, Mr. Dunlap, who had the greatest impact on my life. Then he introduced me to Andre and Sandra Crouch, who are just historical figures in the gospel music field. And he introduced me to Andre and Sandra. And so they were like the core of all the names you mentioned, like Michael Jackson, Quincy Jones, Stevie Wonder, Diana Ross. Andre and Sandra Crouch are the ones who hired me for those gigs. So it was Andre and Sandra that are like the foundation of my career. Wow. Besides them, was there one person or was it them who kind of became a beacon, a mentor, someone who showed you the ropes? Well, I never had a manager. I was always just blessed oh, really? to. Yeah. People called me, you know, one thing always led to another. It was like a snowball effect. Once I started working on the gigs, people would hear me and go, oh, we want her to do this. And oh, you know, so it just snowballed. So I didn't have a manager. I was just uh, fortunate. My brother was well connected in, in, in the industry, my brother, Andrew. And so he would introduce me to people. So there was no one person other than, I'm gonna tell you who had the greatest effect on my life was my music teacher in high school. Because mm. he saw the gift in me. He asked me one day, first he sat down at the piano, he started playing classical music. I was blown away. I was 14. And he looked at me, he saw the look on my face. And he said, you want to learn how to play the piano? I said, yes. And from that day on, every weekend I would go to his house. And back then, you know, going to your teacher's house was okay. It was okay. <laughs> yeah, right. It would have been totally questionable now, but I would go to his house and he gave me free piano lessons for the entire three years that I was in high school. And so Mr. Bernie Dunlap, he is responsible for showing me how to cultivate my gift and teaching me all that I'm all that I know about music and then guiding me. I ended up going to Long Beach State majoring in music. So it was my music teacher. He, and unfortunately he died many years ago, mm -hmm. but he had the greatest effect on my life. He became as important to me as my father, wow. which, is, which is why I, I encourage parents Find whatever your children are interested in, find a mentor, find somebody that is in that field and guide, guide, because I taught my kids music, but all parents can't teach their kids everything. They may not have the experience, but they can guide them to someone who does. And so that's what my mom did. My brother and my family, they found Mr. B Mr. Dunlap, who became my mentor, my guide, my teacher, my friend, you know, and he's responsible for everything I've been able to do in my career. So it was my music teacher. So those band instructors and those music teachers in, in school, oh, very yeah, important. 
very important, very impactful. And, and many of my friends who worked in the industry, my colleagues have the same story. It was that band teacher or that music choir teacher or that vocal instructor that just gave them everything they needed. Yeah, because most of the times you get the movies where they say, oh, you got to go to Juilliard and <clears throat> and learn yeah. the craft, but it also right. it's a lot yeah. simpler than that. Yeah. Did you or do you get nervous when you go on stage? I used to get freaked out nervous. <laughs> <laughs> For so many years, I was nervous. I mean, excessively nervous where my stomach would churn and I would sweat. And after like 20 years, I was like, okay, Jackie, enough. You know, I started self-talk. I would talk to myself because I mean, 20 years and I had been established as a well, you know, regarded singer. So I just started telling myself, Jackie, you got this. This is what you do. You're gifted. You can handle it. You've been doing it for this long. Just go out there and do what you do and relax. And so the self-talk is what helped to calm the nervousness. And now I've been doing it so long. Yeah. It's <laughs> I don't part of that it. little bit of anxiety, though. But you know. just, I mean, the normal, natural, you, the yes. feelings you get before you get started. But once I get on stage or once I start doing what I'm doing, it's like home to me. So I don't have that same issue. Yeah. Yeah. It's like speaking in front of a crowd. Too. Exactly. Like, yeah. Exactly. The nervousness, you get better at it. But yeah, even coming onto this broadcast, I've done this like a thousand times. And yeah. since 2012, I've been kind of nice. broadcasting yeah. for a long time. And yeah. I still get that anxiety, right? So, Do you? <laughs> well, you got to set up because technology, right? Every Something's right. going to go wrong or right. something freezes <laughs> or whatever. But yeah, you still get, I mean, not like nervous, whatever, yeah. but just that little niggle. And then once you start talking. Yeah, it goes away. Right. Yeah. And it all depends on the person you're talking to, right? So yeah. I imagine, like, let's get into that. Audiences, how um, different are they? And how do you have to adapt your presentation? Or do you have to adapt your presentation to different audiences? Absolutely. Absolutely. Most of what, most of what I've done for the last, well, I've worked for the church. For the last 24 years, mm. uh, 30, 34 years. And so they kind of, my career in the secular industry kind of overlapped the church. So I did a lot of singing, you know, in, in the industry and then started doing the church. So I was doing both for a while. Now it's, it's mainly church. I go out and I speak to different people. I, I do more speaking now than I do singing. Cause I was saying I, my, my career spans 40 years. And after doing something for that long, it's kind of time to make a transition. But the, the audiences, they differ religious or spiritually, religiously, and culturally. Mm -hmm. So I only, the only time I adjust my presentation is if I'm in, an, in front of an audience that is not religious at all. So I can't go in there talking about God and, you know, doing what I do in church. So that's the only adjustment that I have to make. But it's interesting that you would mention the different audiences because culturally there are a lot of difference. Like if I'm in front of a black audience, they're, re they're very vocal. You know, they talk back to me and they say, yeah, amen, or those kind of things, right? Then I'm in other cultures, they just sit quietly and you don't even know what kind of effect you're having until after the performance. And then so many people come to me and say, oh my God, it was so wonderful. And I'm thinking I couldn't tell because you were, you were just sitting there, but yeah, they vary, they differ. Yeah, that's gotta be a hard because yeah if you can't see even on their face how they're responding right. and that actually reminds me of a really old clip from the 60s of Mahalia Jackson singing to an old oh. crowd she has no microphone when she walks away and her like she's singing we will overcome it was so emotional for her that she broke down and she couldn't continue but as um, she's walking off the stage to the back, you can hear her just as so loudly as if she had the microphone. But again, they show the faces in the audience, no reaction, like, or yeah. they're, they're engrossed, but yeah, they're not, you know. <laughs> yeah, they're just sitting quietly, taking it <laughs> yeah. all in. Yeah. yeah. Mind you, that was in the 60s too, but you would think that would change. <laughs> oh, yeah. So how often, now I've always wondered about this because I'm really trying to be conscious of what, I mean, yeah, it's a t-shirt, it's a pink t-shirt, big woo, but I don't want to wear this pink t-shirt three times in a row, right? Yeah. So I'm always kind of like, 
when I wear the last 10 times, I can't repeat right. that. So, so yeah. when you're on stage, do you wear an outfit after it's been worn once on camera during a performance or a red carpet? Can you wear it again? Or are you, do you just like <laughs> sell it? You know, you, that's, <laughs> it's funny that you would ask that question because I had an outfit special made for the Grammys. My son was nominated for a Grammy in 2020, 19 or 20, whatever. No, no, no. 21. He was nominated for a Grammy and he took me with him to the show. So I had a special made outfit and that was two years ago and I didn't wear it again until my 60th birthday celebration. And so I, mean, I figured I took that opportunity to make use of it again because we spent all that money. It was like, it, you know, it didn't make sense to wear it one time. So I was able to wear it again at my birthday party, but I probably won't ever <laughs> wear it again, you know, yeah. but I mean, it's okay. You know, the Grammys, yeah. that's the way it is. People well, have yeah. special dress, Grammy dresses and that they wear at one time. And a lot of time they're borrowed, aren't they? Or they do yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Be, no, a lot, there's a rent, rent account. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The tour schedule. It's probably hard to describe how grueling it can be if you're on a long tour. Because you toured with some pretty big names, so you would have had a pretty exhaustive schedule. How would you describe it, and how much time do you actually have in between dates, and do you have any time for yourself? It always varies. It depends on who you're with. Some people who just want to book dates and show, do one show after another. I've done that. In fact, I was on a tour many years ago where we did a show every night in a different town. That was the most grueling experience because we would show up at the town, get go to the venue. We wouldn't even go to a hotel. We'd just go to the venue and the dressing rooms is where we'd shower and get dressed and then you know eat and do the show and then go get on the bus and sleep on the bus <laughs> till we get to the next town and do the same thing. That was insane. And I only did that once, but it varies. Different artists. I was with Chaka Khan and we went to Japan for three weeks and we only did like six shows in three weeks, which gave us plenty of time to see the cities and see the places, see Tokyo. I got a good tour of Tokyo and had fun there, but it always varies. It can be as grueling as the first one I described every night doing a different show or somebody who's older like Shaka. And this was back in 2012. So it was a while ago, but you know, she's just not going to do a show every night. So it just depends on who you're with. Yeah, the older we are, the less we want to work that way. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so as a songwriter, how exhausting is it to mix music after you've come up with a song? Because I'm a writer, not a songwriter, but mm -hmm. writing books, I'm working on my 19th book. Oh, wow. It's beautiful. <clears throat> so the more you do it, the easier it becomes, but... But it's not easy. No. So no. describe what that process is like and... I mean, sometimes a song just comes to you. Sometimes, oh my God, takes yeah. a year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I but what have, about yeah. once it's together and all mixing it together? You've got all the equipment yeah. and everything. You have to have the techn technological skill set to do the whole process. I don't have that gift. <laughs> my gift is sit down at the piano and the words just kind of, it, it's almost like they come to me. I don't create anything. It's like, it, it, almost like it's from another source that I just sit and listen and hear and then I start singing and playing. Or even one time I dreamed a song. And, I've and done that. the entire song. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, you know, it's, so, it's kind of a spiritual experience because I woke up and that song that I dreamed is called My Help and it became one of the biggest songs in the gospel industry. It's, it has gone around the world, been translated into different languages and people sing that song in churches literally around the world. I, a friend of mine was in London and she, they, he called and said, you know, they were singing your song in the church in London and France. And that's the song that I dream. And it has the greatest impact of all the songs that I've ever written. But once I write the song, then I'll take it to somebody like my brother or my sons who have their, my sons are all uh, studio engineers. So I don't, like I said, I don't have that skill set <laughs> at all. You know, I'm a but you got to be in the room with them while they're doing the song. Oh, it's absolutely. Song. Oh, and it's a long process. It is a process because once you write the song, then there's all the different, you have to decide if you want live music, live instruments, or if you're going to do everything digitally, you know, program and play everything on a controller. So that's the first decision. In a live band, that's a totally different process because you have a big studio with drums and the speakers and the bass guitar and all of that stuff. 
but that doesn't happen nowadays like it used to. If you go back and you look at old recordings like, um, oh, I can't think of any artists right now, Donny Hathaway, or for example, or Aretha, they had live music. Yeah. Today, people typically just do everything digitally where you can have one keyboard, which is called a controller, and then you just program it to sound like violins and you play you play it on the keys. So that's kind of what happens a lot today. And it's getting progressively, it keeps changing because yeah. that was the way for a long time. Now, a lot of producers are doing the copy and paste. They don't even create anything. They just find samples or they find someone else's song and they get a license to use it. And then they copy and paste and use that song and they put their lyrics on top of it. So it just keeps changing. The more technology advances, the less talent <laughs> is necessary <laughs> to make good music. Yeah, unfortunately. And we're not going to get into the AI part of it, but that's scary. Oh my God, yeah. It's scary it's so AF. And well, yeah. Drake, the Drake thing. Yeah, it's... You it's, know, it's, it's scary is like the best way to describe it. Cause... This is why this strike is so important. Right. It is. It really this is. This is not just for the movie industry or the TV industry. This is for every industry. Yeah. And I know you say we're not going to get into it, but I think it's already out of control oh, i don't think i do agree well look at drake <laughs> where it is right now right yeah so it yeah I, and who I'm, do you sue who, if you know you got to go down a rabbit hole to find the right. the origin and yeah right. and you never know when you're looking at something online or on screen you never know if it's real or not it's a real person or if it's an ai sometimes you can but yeah. It, I guess it depends how good the AI is. <laughs> right, right, yeah. In writing, you can. I mean, unless they're just terrible writers, but like yeah, AI does yeah. not write well, I don't think. <laughs> I don't think so either. <laughs> not to my standard. I've, in my writing, I've used AI, but only to get ideas. Well, yeah. Ideas and, you know, and then I write my own stuff, but yeah. I know exactly. there are people who can write books the whole thing and then they're selling them online well ai to me is like google i mean yeah you're going to google stuff right and use okay i need this idea like i don't know where to find it so I'll google something and oh yeah, yeah. that's what i'll use exactly so it, i mean that's how you should use it but should <laughs> <laughs> you can't copyright it if it's ai i don't think because well you can't copyright it if it's ai but i mean if you're going to put out like that Drake song or if you're going to put out something and you didn't put any creative thought into it and let a computer do it yeah. <laughs> there, there can't be any copyright on that right right so imagine once you put that song together it's such a relief but this is another question I have and I'm so glad I can ask this don't you get sick of all the hits to sing over and over again? I mean, I always wonder that about artists when you want to hear it as a fan, of course. But you to sing that song over and over and over again for decades, doesn't that <laughs> literally drive you insane? You know what? It's so interesting that you would ask that question. I've never been asked that question, but that is Are absolutely you kidding? Nobody have ever, nobody's ever asked me about that, but it is absolutely, absolutely an issue. When I was with Shaka, she was trying to do new music and present it to the audience. And the people were, people were like literally yelling out, sing I'm Every Woman or sing, you know, sing something they yeah. know. And for me, it's the song that I mentioned, My Help, Everywhere I Go, people want me to sing that song. And, the, and one of the issues is I was 30 something when I recorded that song. I'm 60 now and my voice is a little bit different than it was when I was 30, 35. And so I'm trying to do what the audience is expecting. They're expecting to hear what they heard on the record. Yeah. And, and it's different. And so it is a challenge. It is a real challenge. But then again, you have to adapt to your voice now. I mean, previous conversation before we jumped into the Zoom you kind of figured out I'm a bit of a headbanger. And I've seen <laughs> Judas Priest in concert like a gazillion times. They're my nice. favorite band. Rob Halford, I mean, God, he's got to be in, at least in his 70s anyway. I don't know how old yeah. he is. But his voice gets strong, just as strong now as it was back in the 80s. And yeah. But when you see him perform live, he does adaptations like he sings different because 
when he gets to that real high, 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 high stuff, he bends over to sing it. It's like, it's got to come, right? He never used to do that. But I think the older he is, every time he does that real high pitch stuff, I notice he always like bends over to do wow. it. But, uh, Maybe I should uh, try bending over when, <laughs> when I have to hit a high note. Well, it might not work for you. It works for him because you got like, right. the other guys on. But, but yeah, it's, it's interesting because, I mean, Tony Bennett, God, you know, he just passed. It feels like an end oh, wow. of the era. Yeah, he passed this. I didn't know when. He I mentioned it this realize. morning. When I turned on the TV wow. at 7, they said oh. he passed. And he was 96, I think. And of course, he had Beautiful. dementia. Oh. But mm. he could still sing. Wow. Yeah. And it was only a couple of years ago he did that duo with um, Lady Gaga. And yeah. those yeah. pipes are still strong. So yeah. there was that mystique that you would lose your voice as you get older maybe it's true for some yeah but a lot of times you don't is that because you work on it like you treat your I mean it's an instrument right so, absolutely absolutely um, although yeah, smoking I, sometimes does give you that raspy but yeah you got to take care of it right yeah you do you do and I think it's different with everybody because I know women my age who don't have the issue but for me I think menopause and the hormonal changes mm-hmm. just like a, a, a boy going through puberty you know the changes in, in women when they reach menopause they do have an effect on my voice is lower than it used to be and I have adapted like I'll change the key to the songs that I used to sing I'll lower the key a little bit so it's not as difficult you know but it absolutely matters like your lifestyle will affect what happens over time and I wish I had known back in my 20s and 30s what I know now and how it would affect me but because I went through the period of drugs and all that stuff and so it did have an effect but everybody did yeah (laughs) right you were right. alone. I know. Like, oh, I know. I wasn't alone. I'm sure. the band. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, and I'm glad to be on, long on the other side of that, but you have to take care of your, and I teach students, I teach piano and voice. And I always tell my students, you are your instrument, your whole, you have to take care of yourself as if you had an instrument, you would care carefully care for that instrument, keep it clean, keep it stored properly, keep it in a, the right temperature and all those things. We well, have to do the same thing for yourself because as a singer, your body is your instrument. And if you don't take care of yourself, it will absolutely affect what you're able to, to do. It's just like writing, songwriting, or any other kind of writing, sleep, sleep deprived. Or, you know, <laughs> I always wonder, like, there's always the stories about Saturday Night Live and how they're always like high when they're writing their skits. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. In the old days, right? Right. But I think that might last for a little while. But if you don't smarten up, because most of those guys, that, even in the musicians, like from the 70s, 80s, who did lots of drugs, they're all clean now. Otherwise, yeah. you couldn't see Iron Maiden on stage anymore if they weren't clean, I don't think. Right, 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 right. No, <clears throat> and, you know, there's no longevity in that lifestyle. No, there is not. <clears throat> what was the toughest moment you had to deal with in the music industry? The toughest moment was when I had to choose between staying here and taking care of my babies. They were babies at the time Mm -hmm. and committing to my job at the church or going on a three month tour with Stevie wonder. Oh my God. (laughs) Yeah. So I ended up not going on the tour Mm -hmm. because I was a single parent and uh, I had three boys, three baby boys, and they were like three, four and five. And so there was no one that I was going to leave my children with for three months while I went gallivanting around the world. It was hard. It was a very hard decision because Stevie was my idol. And and I talked about earlier when you first asked me about when I fell in love with music, after that experience with my mom teaching us how to sing, when Songs in the Key of Life came out, Stevie's, which to me is one of the greatest musical productions ever. I would lay in my bed and listen to, I was in middle school and I would lay in my bed with my headphones and my cassette player. And I would listen to Songs in the Key of Life over and over and over. And I fell in love with that. And, and I, Stevie Wonder was such an, inspiration and like my idol back then so to have the opportunity to tour with him was a dream but I had to turn it down because I had the babies and I had to keep my job at the church so that was one of the most difficult 
uh, things that I went through in the industry. However, there's a beautiful side to that story. It, I, told, I just told you I celebrated my 60th birthday a, a few months in March this year. And my son threw me a huge party, amazing party. And guess who came to my party and sang happy birthday to me? <laughs> Stevie oh, Wonder. Oh, wow. So you yes, got he the... Uh... He sang happy birthday. He sang the whole song. <laughs> and he sang my Sharia more, except he changed it to Mama Jackie. Mama Jackie, lovely as a summer day. So it was it was surreal. He and my son worked together. And so my son, D Smoke, called him and asked him if he would make a video wishing me happy birthday that he could play at the party. And Stevie said, party? I want to come to the party. <laughs> so <laughs> awesome. it was just, yeah. So that was like a full circle moment, you know? I, I couldn't tour with him, but, you know. But, you know, things have changed a bit since then, too, because... Today, you could probably take your kids with you. Yeah. Yeah, they have changed. Yeah. Fortunately, Pink, my kids Pink are in their travels with her kids, doesn't she? And like most of them probably do. Pink. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. I love her. She's amazing. Yeah. yeah. I, she has a documentary about her on Amazon. Huh? Is there like front and center? Her husband travels with her. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, well, when you're an artist at her level, then you can afford to do those things. Yeah. When you're just starting out, it's, yeah, it's kind of Different. tough. Yeah. Not as a background singer, I couldn't have done that. No, no, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't have the cred yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> How old were your sons when they got into music? You know what? I started teaching them when they were toddlers, literally, because because and I tell the story all the time. It's in my book. When I was seven, my mother started me with piano lessons, but my teacher, his name was Mr. Butch, and he was awful because he used to pop, he had a stick. When I, when I made a mistake, he would pop my fingers. It was, it was terrible. And so I told my mom, I don't want to play the piano because of him. And, she, and I was only seven and she said, okay. But when I got to high school and I met Mr. Dunlap, I was angry. I was upset with my mother. I was like, I was only seven, mom. I didn't know I was going to be a musician. Why didn't you just get me a different teacher or persist in you know the piano lessons? And so I decided at that time that I was going to teach my children. When I had children, I was only 15 years old. And I decided when I have children, I'm going to teach them music. So I started teaching them. They were like three, four, and five. I would stand them around the piano and just start teaching them how to sing and teaching them vocal technique and music theory and how to play the piano. Daniel D. Smoke is an amazing pianist. And so they've known music for their entire lives. They started when they were like 12, 13, and 14, or 11, 10, 11, 12, something like that. My brother, Andrew, who is the one who was responsible for my career, he gave them an entire studio full of equipment. He was upgrading his studio. Yeah. So he gave them all of his equipment. He gave them a computer. He gave them a controller. He gave them the programs. He gave them, he gave them everything that they needed to get started. So they were like 10, 11, 12, 11, 12, 13, when they started learning how to produce and how to write music. But it took them almost 20 years to reach the level of success that they are now. And, you know, people think people saw D Smoke on the Rhythm and Flow show and they think he was an overnight success. <laughs> There's no such thing as overnight no. success. Yeah, he's been working for 20 years. He was just ready when the opportunity presented itself, you know? Yeah. And do you get to perform with them very often? I do. I do. And that's the beautiful thing about my sons and my relationship with them, because like, for example, the sacrifice that I made with the Stevie tour, I sacrificed a lot when they were little to focus on them and not on myself. But now they, they adore me and they honor me and they respect me and they invite me to everything. And they give me tickets and they even feature me on some of the songs I've sung on D Smoke's record a, a few times. And so whenever he's in town or somewhere nearby and he's going to do a show and I show up, he calls me on stage to sing with him the song called Black Habits. And so, um, yeah, they feature me whenever they can. And I love it. I love it. That's the clip that I saw. I've been sharing that clip, actually, with you. Oh, cool. And uh, that was from the Netflix show, was it? Or yeah. no, was that? No, no, that was BET. BET. Oh, us singing together. Yeah. 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 So having such a musical family has to put a lot of pressure on everyone, not just your kids. <laughs> yeah. You know, the person that it puts the most pressure or the people in our family that it puts the most pressure on are the ones who don't have the musical gift. Oh, <laughs> they gosh. Like I have a younger <laughs> brother. Right. I was 16 when he was born. His dad is different from my dad. My mom was remarried. 
And so he doesn't have musical talent at all. And he hates it because everywhere we go, everybody, like when, when we have family gatherings and we are all around the piano singing and stuff, and he's just like kind of there watching. So it's difficult for him. It, it's challenging sometimes when one is more successful than the other, that there's no jealousy or anything like that, especially with my son. They all support each other a lot, but it can be a challenge when you want to be at a certain level and your other family members are soaring and you're kind of struggling on the runway. So it's a bit of a challenge, but it's not a big deal because we are, we're such a supportive clan. We got so much love in this family. It's, it's amazing. Wow. And your books do dive into a lot about your past and your drugs, but how have you changed as a person since getting clean? Wow. Oh, well, I've changed so many times since getting sober, you know, I've been between, cause I was 26. Oh, I can't tell you exactly. I was mid twenties when I got sober, but I was still a child. Even though I had three kids, I was still a child. I basically had to learn everything because my parents weren't equipped you know, they grew up in the whole, under the Jim Crow and the, all that stuff. So they weren't equipped to give me what I needed. So even as, as a young adult, I had to learn everything. I had to learn how to handle money, learn how to communicate, learn everything. And so that was the first process that I went through in my twenties and early thirties. So when you ask how I've changed, there's so many ways that I've changed. I went back to college because I didn't finish college when I first started, but when my kids were late teens, early twenties, I went back to school. I got my, got my bachelor's and got my master's. And so that process I got my master's in 2019 and that process changed so much about my life. I was able to learn you know, to go back and look at my history and understand how I became who I was, understand subconscious programming and why I made the choices that I did over the years and then go back and undo those things. That's how I changed in the last 10 years or last five years, really, since going back to school and getting a master's. It was a, it was an amazing, the degree itself was not the not the issue because I don't even use it you know what I mean but the process of getting it is what changed me in so many ways and what grew, I grew up even more you know yeah. so yeah there's no and, simple answer to how you change <laughs> right I have to say from hearing about that and, and reading and, and listening to other shows your mother sounds like a saint <laughs> <laughs> she kind of is she she is a beautiful beautiful my mother is my angel because she's the one who was my stability when I was getting sober I lived with her and she helped me with the boys and she helped me handle money when I couldn't handle it on my own and yeah, yeah my mom pretty much is a saint yeah she's amazing yeah so last question music guides our life journey what would be the first song on the soundtrack of your life? Oh, wow. How Would I Know? There's a song, I wrote the song called How Would I Know? And th the message is, if it had not been for all the hell that I went through, how would I know that I would be able to overcome and become who the person that I am now? So that's the soundtrack because I, I mean, while you're going through challenges and struggles and, the, you know, addiction or whatever it, your issues are, you don't know, you can't see while you're in it, the effect that it's going to have later. But looking back over my life and seeing all that I went through and overcame, then I appreciate. And that, in fact, that's the, the line in the song. I appreciate the hard times. Otherwise, how would I know? Wow. Can't yeah. top that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for, for being on my show. It's been a pleasure, Debbie. This is Debbie Ellickson. Thank you to my guest and to you, the viewer, for watching this episode of Locker Room for Growth. Please subscribe to this channel and check out our past shows and clips in the YouTube playlist. Locker Room for Growth interviews our guests with honest conversation that includes compelling stories and unique professions. We also take great effort to maintain diversity among those who appear on the show. I personally have decades of experience working in multimedia journalism, including copywriting, sports reporting, radio and webcasts, 
and have interviewed and worked with numerous celebrities, including Hurricane Carter, the Doobie Brothers, professional NHL, CFL, and baseball players, and more. The show broadcasts from Treaty 7 on Turtle Island, the traditional territory of the Blackfoot people, which includes Siksida, Blood, Pikani, Sutina, Stony Nakoda Nations, and Métis Nation Region 3. Again, thank you for watching and please subscribe.